My name is Ed Piscor. My name is Jim Rugg. Jim, what weekend is it, man? March 30th. The earliest days of spring, man. And we got our fucking books drawn. The heavy lifting is over, man. <laughs> yeah, it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling, and it's perfect time of year. I, I was talking to somebody about finishing these books this time and drawing a lot through the winter, and they're like, that's the most productive time. You know, January, February, what else are you going to do, especially in our climate? And, uh, and they're right, you know, build the schedule around that winter, uh, winter work period. The, the Center for Cartoon Studies and the Joe Kubert School and SVA, they're in those regions for a reason, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of motivation to get work done. <laughs> it's even colder up there. Yes. I always hear that with Chicago cartoonists. You know, it, you just go into your place, your workspace for months and uh, wait out that, that frigid weather. And that is a multi-generational comic book town from the underground comics to those Chicago Imagist guys, to Klaus and Ware, to Paul Hornschmeyer and Jeffrey Brown. For sure, long legacy there. And, and it makes sense, you know, I think all of these cool areas are where uh, a, lot of, a lot of creativity takes place. Can we call this the victory lap episode? Look at these fucking piles, man. Absolutely. I was so excited to come here and see the X-Men pile, to add the Plain Janes next to it. Uh, it's a great feeling. Like, like we said, this is one of those, as a, as a comic book artist and other comic book artists can relate to this, the pile, the finished pile of artwork is one of those great moments. Well, let me ask you this, man. This pile that you set, for, set before us right there, is this what you drew in the past six months or is this all the Plain Jane stuff? This is all the plain Jane stuff, barring like some bigger, I have bigger pages. These are mostly in the nine by 12 area, but I have two page spreads and some stuff that didn't make it. And I have some that was sold. This chunk is basically the, uh, the last three months. That's a good winter haul for sure, man. Yeah, it was, it was more than a page a day pace. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that output. And what was the timetable like uh, for all of it? It's basically a decade. Yeah, the first one, I should know this, and I don't. It's probably 2006, 2007, so probably a little over a decade. Obviously, he didn't work on a damn thing day <laughs> in, day out. Like, No, no. Did a lot of work in between that. And maybe that's some fun stuff to talk about, man. Like, I was just recalling everything that transpired from page one to fucking page 241 of this. And by the way, there's about 600 pages of stuff here because some of these pages just have special effects. There are a lot of pages that I drew twice up. So I was pretty rigid with the four tier system, right. 12 panels a page kind of, kind of breakdown. So I only would do half a page way bigger on a 11 by 17 piece of paper, which added to production time for that issue. That was issue uh, one of, of second Genesis. But even while I was putting this together, I did a giant Nike ad campaign, uh, two rounds of that, mm -hmm. you know, about three months worth of that stuff, designed public enemy figures. I traveled to four or five different countries until I ultimately was like, you know what, I am putting my world travels on hold. And I turned down offers to go to Moscow, to, to Luca, to, you know, to Italy, South America, the UK, Germany, and it's like, Hey guys, man, I'm back. Your homeboy Eddie P is back, man. Coming to a comic festival near you. I had pneumonia while I was working on this, got the flu while I was working on this, went to Angoulême in, 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 in France and was in Paris for a while, Helsinki, Finland, Denmark. To me, the comics that I make are almost like my own personal scrapbook because if anything that deviated from the norm went on while I was putting these pages together on those days, like it's in my mind, like I can have, I'll have almost total recall of that day. So I look through these pages and I'm like, oh yeah, like I designed this while I was uh, on a plane coming back uh, across the pond from Denmark or shit like that. So it's like, th it's like the beginning sequence of those Marvel movies where you see <laughs> yes. panels, man. And that's my life flashing <laughs> before my eyes, like with this, man. Yeah, that's interesting. So that's what I'm getting at, man. Do, do, do you have similar feelings? Like you did so much stuff in between all of this work, man. The big one for me, because there was like a 10 year gap between the first two books and this and this final volume is my whole career is in that 10 years. You know, like I quit my day job in 2007. So that's probably, you know, that's probably like right here or something. That is um, right, man. I remember that like that was that was like a big moment, man, when, when uh, we, we were still all getting together on Wednesdays 
and then you made the declaration you're like yo i'm done with that day job and that's such a big fucking step you were the perfect age man because it's like responsibilities mount up as you as you uh, get older and everything like that and it's like you got to make the effort to give it a go and you gotta it's a good idea to do it as young as possible just so that you have even if you fuck up you're still young as hell yeah the stakes aren't that high it was a big change but that's one that i remember a lot from this story um you know there's stuff that happened in in the in the time working on this final volume some personal stuff happened that really was kind of like curveballs and some difficult bumps you know i've had some stretches where things are very smooth and mm -hmm. often i'll finish a project and think like wow that was five months of like nothing went wrong in my life and i was able to make this book there were some real tough things that happened in the last six months while I was either working on this book, prepping this book, whatever the case may be. And so I look at this and I, and I remember that, you know, like it feels like a lot happened besides the book. You know, you mentioned Angoulême, I did Angoulême, did some traveling in this time. I'm teaching currently with this. So, you know, there's lots of these things that are going on beside this. Like this wasn't the only thing I was doing in that time period. The stuff from the first couple volumes to 10 years ago, I don't remember a lot of, you know, that was a long time ago. The big difference whenever I started working on this again is like going back through that work yeah. and seeing like, I didn't use straight edges for the first two volumes. You know, like I, around this time I started inking uh, Becky Cloonan on American Virgin for Vertigo mm. around the time of the first books. And it was in that inking time that I started to pick up straight edges and French curves. To some people watching this, this means nothing. But now I can't imagine not using those tools. So, you know, if you're curious what that looks like, here are 300 pages, uh, examples of what it looks like to not use straight edges <laughs> whenever, you're, whenever you're drawing, whenever you're inking. These were mostly drawn with brushes. These were mostly drawn with markers and pens. So, you know, it's just a very different artist. Like, it's, it's a couple thousand pages in between this book and these books. And that was really strange. I remember thinking of, like, um, you know, Dan Klaus, whenever he did like a velvet glove uh, cast in... Iron. Okay, <laughs> I always get the iron and the velvet switched in order. Whenever he did that, he serialized it over a few years, and I've read interviews where he talks about he basically was a much better artist by the end of that, but he still had to sort of limit his, you know, showing off that better art ability so that the book fit together as a whole. So that was like one of the biggest challenges with trying to put on like, okay, remember what you were doing 10 years ago as an artist and try to channel that. And that was, uh, that was a big hurdle early on. And it was one that I kind of left go and tried to figure out in finished art. So like in the grayscaling, you know, that's something that can unify the books. It's sort of that surface polish that if you're reading it, hopefully it all looks like a whole. Whereas some of the more minute drawing choices, I know they're very, very different. You know, hopefully it doesn't come across too different to a reader, but you know, my approach to this is just so different. The things I thought about whenever I was laying out a page or a scene, I can remember trying to make each scene feel very distinct. I don't remember that at all in the first books. Ten years later, thousands of pages later, my approach to making comics is very different. So I think it's probably significantly better, <laughs> this new one, but I am trying to keep it unified visually. You know, a lot of those differences are going to be things on the back end. It's the way I laid out pages, laid out scenes, tried to make the scenes distinct from one another. Little things like that. But that's that's the bigger thing that I take away whenever I look at this, Ed, is that like, wow, am I a different artist. Mm. Yeah, I feel like just I, I had tremendous growth spurt working on this X-Men thing from page one to page 241. Just learned a lot about comics. I learned a lot about what you can do with a single page of comics because I had 8,000 pages of material to call down into <laughs> yeah. my 240 page thing. So I was able to like see sort of where the limits were in a lot of ways, man. See see how much I could, I, story I could cram into a single page. It was both positive and negative for me going forward. Comics, like the business of comics is so weird, man, because if you think about it, I just got paid a lot of money to become a much better right. cartoonist. And it's like, they have no stake in me. I have no stake in them. I've developed this giant tool set. And what this pile here represents, I just bought myself a lot of fucking time to just go off and make my own stuff, man. I am super appreciative of that. Now I could see where that would suck if you're just a single discipline 
kind of jobber because now now you have to like get married with somebody to make a thing. But as an independent cartoonist, making the thing, like, whoo, I, I recommend everybody put one of these shits together. I think that's an interesting point, Ed, because it does speak to how the industry has evolved. This kind of thing would have been unheard of. You know, the idea of one artist working, doing their own thing and kind of making a living that way. All the way back, you know, we've been doing this wizard show looking at comics in the 90s, and that was revolutionary thinking in 1992. And now that skill set does evolve. You know, it's, it's almost two different industries where you would be just a penciler. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but I mean, it's a very specialized skill set, the way it might be if you were in any business, you know, if you specialized in arc welding or something, it's a very specialized skill set. But now there's this other whole branch of like, do it yourself, you know, auth author, auteur, author, artist, you know, person that's creating this work on their own. That's always existed, but I don't think it's been as prominent as, as it has come to be in the last two decades. You know, I have self-awareness, man. And if it wasn't for my hip hop comics selling quite a lot with my funky, weird art style, there is not a Marvel comic that looks like mine, man. For better or worse, like, you know, a reader could be the judge, man. But boy, you sell, you sell, you get on that New York Times list, man. You could kind of write your ticket. I like this arrangement where you and Marvel don't have long term commitment to one another. You, you agreed to do a project to work together. You, you know, negotiated a contract that both of you were happy with and neither of you owe any extra it's like you you fulfilled what you said you were going to do they fulfilled what they said they were going to do everybody's happy you know this idea of like you owe me the next thing or i owe them or anything why you know like let's work this way let's agree to work together on something let's both do what we say we're going to do and and that's it and maybe you work together again on something else but that's a different thing you know like it's not it's not implied things it's not like some agreed upon but unspoken truth <laughs> it's just here's the contract let's be happy with it once we're both happy sign it and deliver that's where those old timers that we always see complaining that's where they get crossed up and it makes me i don't know all of those guys you know i know some but it makes you wonder like kind of like what kind of like privilege they must have came from or something because what you and I are talking about right here is uh you know doing mutually good business it's all written out you know that they don't owe you anything else and vice versa and that's that's like that's Pittsburgh shit you know like like we learned this stuff from from our folks who like my parents were both in those steel mills and U.S. still didn't do a damn thing for them. You yeah. know what I'm saying, man? Like, my pops is, is tore down, broken down kind of guy. My, my pops has to be a um, key witness in mesothelioma trials and shit all the time. And, and, and he worked around those brick, too. So, like, the way his whole situation works, man, it's like all of his depositions are kind of, like, held in a, in a special place in case he gets lung cancer and can't testify for himself. Like, so, so that's where I grew up, man. You can't be salty if you see like your imagery like showing up other places. Basically, especially the way Marvel's set up right now, every other Hollywood studio would kill to have such a cheap R&D team to put together story concepts and stuff. And that's like one wing. The other wing of what these big property holders have in terms of like what their business re kind of really is. Because if you draw an amazing Wolverine, expect that to show up on the, the cardboard uh, backing board of an action figure mm -hmm. or something. You know what I mean? Like imagine all that Art Adams stuff, those big standees and goddamn Art Adams imagery on <laughs> Chef Boyardee cans. Right. It's written out there. If they made an X-Men Grand Design movie, which I actually encourage them to do, <laughs> I'm not going to get salty that I'm not going to get, uh, you know, direct money from the, the film because it's going to sell a whole fucking lot of books. And that's what I'm in the business of doing. I'm a cartoonist. I'm a storyteller. I make comics. I want to sell more comics. And that's my interest, you know what I mean? So you're not going to see anything. And you get paid for those. Exactly. If they sell another thousand books, if they sell a hundred thousand or a million whenever a movie gets made, you get paid for those. Exactly. That's what that contract is. Exactly. Speaking of the way the industry has evolved, for me, it's like we said, it's been over 10 years. Yes. The genre of young adult has exploded. Mm -hmm. So whenever we first did the Plain Janes, we were kind of early on in that emerging trend, you know, especially for graphic young adult graphic novels. So that's something I'm excited to kind of like put the book back out yeah. because my editor at, at Little Brown was a fan of the original books. I see. You know, like she's young, she's younger than I am, and so <laughs> she read those books as you would, you know, as a fan whenever they came out and. 
that whole generation has grown up. You know, I think we saw that like um, a lot of the filmmakers would talk about like the 80s and Watchmen books having that influence. Like those fans grew up to then become the filmmakers who were able to make these comics make sense on screen. And we're starting to see this generation now that has grown up with things like young adult books, comics for all ages, web comics, all of this stuff. It's sort of like become the norm. Yeah. And I'm very excited to be able to like, let's put this material back out. Let's see how this works now. Let's see if I can compete now in a genre that's huge and popular and has great practitioners, but also rabid fan followings. You know, libraries stocking graphic novels is pretty new in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. So all of these things in terms of the industry have changed drastically in a very short period of time. And since the original publication of the first Jane's book, so I'm, I'm pretty excited by that. Just like the chance to put this book out in essentially a new environment, new audiences, new distro channels. That's pretty awesome. You know, as, as I do self-publishing, I work with a variety of publishers. These are things that I intersect with and have my whole career. So it's exciting. It's part of, you know, what I keep an eye on because I too want to sell these books and want to maximize how many books I can sell. And so like seeing new avenues open or seeing these audiences grow uh, I'm I'm very excited to take advantage of that. This uh, these binders here are my uh, scripts for yes. for the X Men comic. I basically just on typing paper just mm -hmm. just draw a version of the comic, right? So I went down to Target and bought my script for my next thing. You know, bought my plastic <laughs> nice. pages yeah, and all yeah, that stuff. Exciting. But when I was down there, I walked past the uh, the book aisle and everything. I saw some Raina Taugemeier comics in there. Her whole body of work, basically, with Scholastic is is there, man. So it's not inconceivable that the Plain James big tome ends up there. What's The way it gets there is you sell a bunch. Yes. You know what I mean? And it becomes attractive. Like, Target's not going to want to lose a dollar. Exactly. It's very exciting. Yeah. And by the way, those are the only comics in, in that store. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Rain is uh, su like super, <laughs> super woman. I hope this shows up well on uh, the, the camera to the kayfabers out there, but I'm taking a look at your pile, yeah. and you could see a more yellowed stack, <laughs> which is indicative <laughs> of like the, the decades old uh, material. Yes. Yeah, that could be, uh, that, uh, certainly yeah. a different paper stock. Like well, this, this may be um, DC issued paper. Uh, you know, it could be, it, it's absolutely some differences in paper. What paper did, changes what, all the time. What do anyway. they call that when you look at uh, layers of rock to yeah. tell the age of it? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like that. And then you could tell like, uh, because none of my stuff is in order. So you could see like more yellowed ones here and there. And those are clearly like the earlier pages. This is the original X-Men Grand Design. Probably <laughs> right about there if, if it looks. That's like, really cool. You see what I say? I guess I have like a lot of like acid in my fingers or something, man. That's real funny. <laughs> yeah, the paper stock, you know, cartoonists talk about all of these things, and I don't put a lot in any particular tool. Like, I've drawn with everything on everything in the last, since I started. Everybody disses me, man. They're like, yo, you only use Strathmore 300, man? Oh, <laughs> and, 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 and I say, yeah, and I use a fucking Windows computer too, man, so <laughs> kiss my ass. Well, I mean, if it works, it works. You know, if, it, if, if my ink was bleeding everywhere, I would, I would certainly switch paper, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not too much of a materials snob in that way. I get it. I understand why you might want to use archival material over whatever cheap supplies are out there, but at the same time, like this is production art. The better it looks, the better the finished piece will look, but I'm also not beholden to this. Right. <laughs> I can put mistakes on this. I can do corrections on other paper. I can do corrections digitally. I don't really care. Like this is definitely just a piece. When I was doing, um, you know, this is all grayscaled. And I- My shit is definitely production art. Look, man, some of these pages just have like, this is like pretty much a special effects page. You know, and, and this one is like backgrounds. Like I was playing with this idea of drawing the backgrounds on a separate piece of paper and then making the, the line uh, a little bit lighter so that the foreground characters pop. I did that for an issue. Like I did a lot of production stuff. Like I, I used their technology and their printing presses to really play around with my process. I developed some new colors. I developed some new techniques, man that uh, are gonna be Im implemented in my future works, man. I didn't mean to cut you off though, Jimmy. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, like there's, you colored this stuff. So, you know, however it looks in this version, yeah. it's so far from the finished mm -hmm. piece. You know, like it's, these are just like ingredient, raw materials that, that you're using to create that finished piece. You know, same with mine. Like I would go from the line art, I would scan this and then export it to my iPad where I would grayscale it. 
and I had developed a palette of like five grays and I would think of it as coloring yeah. because it wasn't always about like any sort of attempt at realism. You know, if this were a photo, what, what would the values be? It was more about like, how do you, how does this scene stand out? Mm -hmm. You know, like I would have scenes that were primarily white to differentiate them from scenes that had preceded it that were darker or interior settings. Same with seasons, you know, like scenes set in winter, I would make one of the darker grays for the sky color. Um, you know, basically built on what we see around here. Yeah. As the seasons go, the light changes. Mm -hmm. And I would think of those grayscales as coloring and have to remind myself, no, it's, it's black and white, it's one color. This will be printed with color ink. Yeah, that's gonna be fun. But the actual files that I made are just made in one color, but it informs so much of that world. You know, however finished these illustrations are, they're still a step from what you're seeing, what readers are seeing. Sawdust, man. This is sawdust <laughs> on the table. Very valuable sawdust. Let's call it a retirement fund. It sounds good. One thing that I'll probably end up doing is putting these into like binders. I, I was thinking about doing the same thing too, man. Like there's those uh, portfolio mm -hmm. plastic sleeves, man. <laughs> you have to buy quite a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can sell one of one of these and, and uh, bankroll all of your portfolio needs, I'm sure. <laughs> For sure. And, I, and it, you know, you just think about stuff like uh, the weird, just the weird expenses that go into this stuff. I was having a conversation with my friend, like, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm over 35 now. So it's, so it's all downhill from here, you know? And the conversation I have with friends are like, about bills sometimes. And I was thinking like, how come you have a way bigger place than I do and I pay far more in, in utilities? And then I realized, oh yeah, I'm, I work from home. Like I'm at my house eight hours more than you and I have a million lights going to like- <laughs> Yes, I'm looking around right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah to, 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 to shine down on my paper, you know? Whenever you write that stuff off when, on your, uh, on your taxes come April, it's not like you're getting over, it's like it's legitimate stuff yeah, that goes into your biz. So I have a reader question that's related to this original art and making these graphic novels. Are you ready to take that? Hit it. All right, this comes from Amir. I am fascinated by how you both are able to make a plan for a 100 plus page book and A, pace yourself to try to do the best job you can and B, are able to let go of a page to keep going to the next one. How do you pace yourself and more importantly, how do you let go of a page to move on to the next one? How about you lay yours out real quick? Let me see if mine mirrors yours. All right, so I have deadline very early on. You know, the deadline was negotiated as part of the contract. So before I ever started drawing this, I had a time whenever the pages were gonna be, all, all of them would be due, and even breakdowns of when pieces were due. So I had to do breakdowns by a certain amount. I had to do a signature ahead of time, or, or you know, by a certain date so that they could make arcs. And then I had to deliver all of the artwork by a certain date. So I had all of those dates um, figured out before I drew anything. Then it's just, and then I get a script. So the script breaks down page count. So I knew, you know, it's 151 pages. I have X amount of time to that deadline. It's just simple division. You need to do this many pages per week. And then you can break it down and say you need to do this many pages per day. So that's how I, that, you know, that's how I schedule. And usually I will, I will leave a couple of weeks as a cushion. Right. From macro to micro. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you know, you could go further and further. If you said, I'm gonna work eight hours a day, that means you have to do a page in four hours or, you know, whatever it breaks down to. But I mean, like you can get very, very specific and then it's a matter of the discipline of like, okay, draw those two pages, you know, five days a week or, or whatever the schedule calls for. If you're, if you're a new cartoonist out there, I think we could break it down even further. And I encourage you to do a panel a day the discipline of making comics is something that I think you have to kind of build up to. You have to build patience muscles, I, I call it. Early on, everybody has like the three page limit where, where they, they come up with some interesting story. And I'm talking about in your teenage years or whatever. And you get maybe three pages in and your development as an artist really grows rapidly when you're at a young age. I don't know what it is, man. It's like you're looking at a lot of stuff. I don't know how that phenomenon occurs but it occurs with everybody you have these like rapid growth spurts and by that third page you're already far better than you were on that first one so everybody just abandons the com the comic mm -hmm. and then goes on to their next thing like i hear this story over and over again and then eventually you complete something you know that comes later you do maybe 100 pages worth of stuff and then you finally like finish something but it's probably gonna be a small thing. There, there are exceptions to the rule where people turn out that book, you know? And then you, do, you work up to that 100 page, 
150 page, 250 page graphic novel. And that's where my head is. And that's my suggestion to people. Like when it comes to like my comics, the process of making comics like this is everything to me. Like the final printed page, uh, the final printed comic, that's for you guys. You know, because like my investment is, is out of it. Like these books come out, yours is coming out in 2020. You're going to be working on something else by then, and you're not going to be thinking about this that much. Yeah, I think I have three books planned before then. There you go. When it comes to just like turning this stuff out, I guess, I, I, don't, I don't have something that I can really articulate as part of my philosophy. It's just like I have a million ideas. I'm bound by the human condition. I'm not going to have an infinite amount of books in me. How many more do I have? 15, if I'm really, really lucky? So you, you do the work and you get it out of your system, man. My personal goal is to try to do at least two pages a week at this like big size, Ben. There are examples too of, of cartoonists that have these ideas of how much you should do. Chris Ware comes to mind for two pages a week. Yeah. You know, and that seems like a pretty good rate if you're doing everything yourself. If you're writing, drawing, coloring, that's a lot. Um, you know, so it kind of depends on how much you're doing as well. You know, Dave Sim, like growing up, Dave Sim was somebody who talked a lot about self-publishing and creating and advocated for a page a day. 20, a, he did 20 pages a month and for a 30 lot of years. Pros, you know, that was kind of the standard thing when I was growing up was about a page a day. If you were going to do a monthly book, that's your rate. And it's simple math. You know, how many days do you have in a month? A day a page is kind of a really easy somebody that doesn't know math can, can do that math. <laughs> um, you know, so that was always the thing I grew up with was around a page a day. There's that great Dave Gibbons Watchmen book that shows the calendar with the X's. So that's like the visual reminder of, you know, what you're drawing each day. I know people, calendar. I know pe people who use that system and they describe that it's a very satisfying thing to put those X's at the end of the day and to have like tangible evidence yeah. that you are, uh, you've done something. Frankly, just, Working in comics and like making comics the way that I do, you're looking at this is about a, th a little bit more than a thousand days worth of my life, like sort of on record, and and I sort of love that. You yeah. know what I mean? I love having like something tangible to account for my existence on this damn globe. Uh, one of my suggestions that I would give uh, a newer cartoonist or somebody working on their first book is to just set yourself up for battles that you can definitely win. Now I'm not saying make your setup or or your set of uh, deadlines so lax that you have so much time to catch every fucking Steph Curry basket. Set yourself up for battles that you could win so that you don't overreach, so that you don't beat yourself up. That's a good one. There's a mindset to a cartoonist. And early on, many, many, many cartoonists are very, like beyond self-effacing, it becomes self-flagellating and they fucking hate themselves for not being able to hit their marks. So give yourself some, some realistic marks, man. If you work a day job, the panel a day thing isn't a bad way to go because that's basically a page a week on top of the eight hours that yeah. you have to work and who knows how much commuting you have to do plus other personal responsibilities. Do that, do that panel a day. You'll have a 60 page comic at the end of the year. Yeah, time flies. That's what I was just gonna say. So what about uh, any advice for how do you move on to the next page? Because this is a thing that cartoonists struggle with, right? Is like, it's not good enough, that hand's not right, my perspective's wrong, on and on and on. We just talked about that Man Ben episode last week, a fantastic illustrator, and we watched him redraw one, one pose a dozen times, and nine of those poses look the same to me. <laughs> so like, you know, this, can, this applies to everybody in comics. You know, you talk about the mentality of cartoonists. I think it's very common that we will fixate on something and obsess over it. How do you how do you finish that page? How do you say, hey, this is a B plus, but that's what I'm doing today. Like it's it's off it's on to the next page. Thankfully, like happening upon that that Stephen King on writing book pretty early on, uh, let me know that there are drafts. You don't have to get things right the first time, basically. So the earliest part of my production when it comes to comics is get these pages done get them done and then at the end of the thing i go back through it and then i change whatever i don't like now now i'm not the best guy to answer this regardless of what you think of my work i go back and i try to make sure that i have zero regrets so i will go back and redraw panels and all of that sort of stuff but ultimately we live in a culture of out of sight out of mind so i have a goal of putting out a book a year mm -hmm. and and that's a fairly rigid goal that I adhere to. As a generation of cartoonists that we are and going forward, 
it doesn't benefit you to spend uh, five years on a book. And because I make my income from my comics, the other way that I look at it in terms of just like business wise, I guess, is it costs me between say 25 and 30 G's to live a year. So that means that the investment that I put into a comic is $30,000 worth. Now, if I put out a book a year, I could probably make that 30 grand back with the royalties and all that stuff. But now if it's uh, two years and now it's a $60,000 book that I'm putting together or three, now it's, you know, like 90. Yeah, right. Um, it better be fucking the next Mickey Mouse at a certain point if you're, if you're, if <laughs> you're very true. You, you know, so, so that like my stuff is all pragmatism. I, once again, I'm no trust fund baby, man. You hear from my grammar, never went to college. So I'm very practical. Once again, it's that Pittsburgh mindset, man. Yeah, I, I do a couple of things you mentioned. I keep a list uh, handy for, for notes of like whenever I do see something that like I want that panel, yeah, it's a problem, it needs addressed. I will keep a list mm -hmm. and you know, it, it's priorities. Like I always like the Lorne Michaels quote about Saturday Night Live. They go on at 11.30 on Saturday Night Live, uh, on Saturday night, not because they're, it's ready, it's because it's 11.30. <laughs> and there's a lot of truth to that, you know, and also like, Kyle Baker, I remember reading that he would set a timer for inking pages. This is the far end of the spectrum, but go ahead, man. I, I don't agree with almost any of the Kyle Baker stuff, but go okay. ahead. Okay, well, well, here's, he would set a certain amount of time to ink a page, and he would basically set a timer to half of that time, and he would go in, take his time, ink the most important, you know, what he felt were the most important elements, faces, expressions, whatever the big pieces were for that page. The timer would go off, he would set it back again, now he has half the time, and finish the page. And I think there's a real wisdom there because I would, I would obsess over this stuff. You know, like part of the reason I think about this so much is because I had to get it in check. Like this was one of those things, you know, and a lot of my friends that are cartoonists, we've had these conversations about OCD and how it will wreck your life. Yeah. And I remember spending eight hours one day on page numbers in a book, in, in a 56 page book, eight hours, it's absurd. And so you, I had to sort of get this under control. And the Kyle Baker thing made me realize like when I would read comics and sometimes you have to put on that reader hat, you know, some of my favorite comics, you start looking at the backgrounds and they're, they're scribbles and they're, you know, just marks that indicate value or texture that, that don't mean anything. They aren't a pretty drawing, but they also aren't relevant. Mm -hmm. And I realized like nobody's looking at that corner of the dresser in the back of the panel, except I'm drawing it five times. <laughs> and you realize, what are you doing here? Like it makes you, in my, it made me a terrible person <laughs> because how much time do I have left? You sure, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna sit here and redraw this thing instead of what? You know, t turning and facing my wife for right. an hour a day? Like you have to kind of like, I, it helped me a lot to put it in perspective. I've been a lot more productive and a lot happier as I've sort of reeled this in and said, these are the important parts and I'm gonna focus on those. I'm gonna draw those first. You know, I ink all over the page and it's not, and it's because of that, you know, I'm going to spend more time on the elements I think are most important and I'm going to deliver this page in whatever time I have allotted for it. Once in a while that goes awry, but for the most part, I think you just have to put your foot down and say, that's it. And if it has to be redrawn, it goes on the list. And if I get done in time, I'll start going through the list. And you always do, you know, you leave time so that you can make those corrections. And as you say, Ed, deliver the best piece you can. Kayfabe cartoonists out there, I think we've given you some fucking gems, man. So you know your marching orders of reading more comics, but the, those of you who draw and make comics, you better get to it, man. <laughs> I guess one big piece of Kayfabe news is that we now have a P.O. box where people could send us those comics or correspondence through snail mail. We got some cool mail this week. Uh, this is from Tom and Will Blake sent samples of their comics. San Legarto, these black and white comics, they're kind of like crime comics. I don't know how well those show up on camera, but they're very attractive and they even included an original page. So uh, try to get the glare off of that, but you can see like these are old school ink slingers lettering on the artboard as they say. Uh, I, I appreciate that. We salute you. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. This is awesome. It's it's got it's got a little bit of a Toth vibe to it with the bold inks and even like the lettering. Uh, Awesome, man. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Paul Grist's work who did Kane. Yeah. Uh, he's done some, some books with Image. I'm a big fan of that. So I love black and white comic art, and these look really great. You guys might kill the Kayfabe channel if you don't send us two copies of stuff, man, and me and Jim <laughs> have to fight over it.
somebody who did send us two copies yes. of a thing. Our kayfabe lieutenant, Punker Mike, man, went above and beyond the call of duty, man, and sent us some of the most amazing fan art that I challenge any of you guys to uh, step to this, man. He sent us these VHS bootlegs of episode one of Cartoonist Kayfabe, man. Spine with like the rental stickers, you know, like it, these are like the kinds of tapes I would buy from IDES, man. You know what I'm saying? These bring back so much memories. Yeah. Like VHS video stores were such a big thing for me. And these are exactly that. They have the screen captures. They have the little write up. Look it's at the physical tape, man. Absolutely it's got, it's incredible. got the, please, you know, be kind, please rewind <laughs> stickers, man. It's so rad. I can't imagine a better cartoonist kayfabe item. So, Punker Mike, thank you so much. And Mike hooked us, hooked me up with a couple of things, man. Uh, he, he's thinking about he's thinking about kayfabe at large, <laughs> and he put together these um, Nintendo cartridges of. Um, X, with X-Men Grand Design labels for display purposes like he it doesn't have the ROM chip in there so you, you can't you can't play the LJN X-Men game but take it from me you don't want to play it <laughs> <laughs> these are amazing I love that people make this stuff so uh, for future giveaways uh, these are these are going out in, in future giveaways basically man so that's awesome the VHS tape is not at least my copy isn't <laughs> Right. Nobody's no. getting that. That one's going in the coffin with me whenever I die. Yeah, 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 yeah. To be clear, man, like he, <laughs> he hooked us up with these tapes, man, but these Nintendo carts are going to be going out to, to kayfabers that, that deserve the, the accolades, man. Buy some stuff from our spread shop, you know, tag us in the image so that we can actually see it, man. Tr be creative with that photo, man. It's going to make you eligible. Also, because we are on this awareness campaign, we're, we're going to cross over to 5,000 within a week, week and a half probably. And we want you guys to help us get that word out for the channel. Uh, our channel, like our channel, is content based, man. We're not cutting promos. We're not taking the easy way out by just making lists, lists of uh, Rob Liefeld panels or something like that. We're getting to the heart of the matter, and we're going in deep. It requires a different kind of awareness because you could be provocative with clickbaity nonsense, man. That just ain't us, man. I think that's really well said, Ed. You know, we've said it a couple of times. I have been so surprised by the response to this this channel. I love comics. I love being able to share the ones I'm into, talk about new ones that come my way that I'm excited about. And the response from all of you has really affirmed that. You know, I didn't know what to expect when we started this. I wasn't sure what we would be getting into and covering. And being able to just kind of like look at these different comics that are exciting, that are different, that that you know maybe have been overlooked in the past. It's been amazing, and it's all because of the response. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we appreciate that a lot. And, and as Ed said, you know, keep sharing that. Like, if you find episodes, we do those show and tells. If those stand out to you, you know, share the ones that you like. Uh, I'm sure that you have friends that are into this stuff. Turn them on to our show. You know, let them know. Like, this is just, you know, we, we say read more comics, and we mean it. So <laughs> that's kind of the essence of what this show is. You know, it's just comics love, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled by it. So... Please keep spreading that word. There's nothing better than word of mouth to get this out there. Last week we had a Rick Veach Palmer's Picks, and that comes from a future Wizard episode that the Kayfabers will see, you know, in forthcoming weeks. And I revealed a big gap in my collection. <laughs> I didn't have the River trilogy of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics that Rick drew. So he saw the video. I got a pretty cold stack of mail <laughs> from, nice. from Roar, Roar and Rick. Very awesome. He said he didn't have issue 24 of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but the last two, he still had, uh, he's still holding weight. But he's doing some interesting stuff lately, man, with print on demand. Mm. He's putting out all these books under his imprint called Sun Comics. I believe they're all available on Amazon. He's even, check this out, he's even starting up King Hell Heroica again, Boy Maximortal. Ooh, amazing. Yeah, you're going to want to get your hands on that. And he's doing a lot of these books that are like single panel. I guess colloquially we would have called it uh, splash pages, but he calls it panel vision. <laughs> and these books are, are really awesome, man. We have some future Palmer's picks coming up. I mean, we have some future show and tells coming up uh, where uh, other Qbert students are involved. And I had a 
two and a half hour conversation with Steve Bissett, those guys are really uh, using print on demand to their to their benefit, and they actually got this wisdom from Kyle Baker to mention the guy. And, it's, and this is something that I do agree with. Uh, Kyle uses one service for hardcover, uses another service for soft cover. Um, I think it's probably all available through Amazon. And then it, when something catches, then you, you have uh, you have an extra tool to proffer whenever you're making deals with an actual publisher. And that's what happened with Kyle Baker's uh, Nat Turner book. It was a self-published thing for a while. And then he was able to show those guys at Abrams like, listen, man, you have to match this. Like, this is what I made. Yeah. You know, hard numbers. This is what I made. And he said that uh, they no longer talk to him like just another fucking douchebag cartoonist, man. It was business people having a discussion, man. Got to be protective of yourself. Yeah, it's good to know. It's it's interesting to check in on the print on demand too. You know, that's been one of those technologies that has really changed what we can do. It's opened up some options. Yeah, like look at this. I mean, these are m many, you know, standard comic format, nice square format. Like clearly Rick is woodshedding and just trying to And it's it's worth showing color. off like some of the, you know, the color work that's that's coming out. I thought that uh, the Max Immortal Jr. Yes. Um, looks really nice. It's a black and white book, but it looks great, you know. As we said a minute ago, fans of black and white comics, so a lot of options out there. Um, very interesting. I may I may be doing a print-on-demand project in the near future. It'll be worth talking to those guys to kind of like see where their mind mm -hmm. is with, with that material, man. All right, so one more uh, bit of reader mail from Nathan Morrow. Love the channel. I was wondering if there are any books on cartooning that you would recommend. I'm looking for books that get into the technical aspects of writing and drawing comics. This is a uh, this is a tough question for me, and you know I've read lots of books. I, I love this subject matter. I love thinking about how to make comics better. I have never found a book that I feel like I've read and then produced a comic. They're, it's very fun for me to read this stuff and to kind of think about my own process. But I think you know in terms of actually like making a book. There's no substitute for just making the book. That's that's it, man. I uh, in earlier kayfabe weeklies, let everybody know. You know, I was going through all those master classes for writing, and the very first thing that all these guys say on the very first episode is, "You become a writer by writing," and it sounds so uh, dismissive, but it's truly not. You have right. to make these damn pages, and you have to be comfortable with the fact that your first comic is going to suck, probably. Yes. The, the odds are against you for making a masterpiece with your first comic. It's probably not going to happen. Get that out of your system. You make you make the next comic. One of the things that uh, on the Aaron Sorkin master class, where he was because he never went to uh, university, he didn't study writing in college or anything like that, and he asked all of the people who like basically work under him in the writers' rooms who went to college and have their masters in this and that. He asked them like, what is the value of going to university and, and studying writing and all that, almost unanimously, they say it gave us four years to get all of our shitty writing out of our system and we were able to practice away from the public view. The other thing that I think it, it benefits is it gives you a reader, you know, presumably several, because from class critiques to whatever uh, instructors you work with, and that can be hard to come by. You know, I can remember trying to give my comics away in the beginning mm -hmm. and having them given back to me. So, <laughs> you know, just finding a reader is tough, and I think that's one of the benefits of, of a more formalized program. Or write, you know, or group, any type of a, a group that, you know, you're forced to, I'll read yours and you'll read mine, <laughs> just to get some feedback as to how these ideas are actually landing. I believe it was the great Art Spiegelman who once said, too much think, not enough ink. You know, like, don't worry too much about the conceptual stuff. For whatever reason, whatever I clicked on Facebook or whatever, like, they're studying for my Google searches, I get these targeted ads mm -hmm. from, like, Gary Vaynerchuk and then also all these other, like, uh, you know, Tom Cruise, Magnolia, fucking uh, <laughs> yeah, right. middle management uh, guru guys. <laughs> And uh, that Gary Vaynerchuk guy is a guy who I actually do like. Yeah, I listen to some of his stuff. And uh, his whole thing is, like, application like don't listen to me all day like don't just go through my archives and just like imagine what it's going to be like when you're a ceo of a fortune 500 company it's like sell something on ebay for make one dollar yeah you know like make one dollar so so like my advice to you like in the theme of this episode is make one panel of goddamn comics then make another one yeah so i think we've been clear on the you want to make comics you want to write or draw something write and draw 
That said, here are some books that I have enjoyed. Um, Art of Game Design, Jesse Schell's book on video game uh, creation focuses a lot on storytelling. Uh, and it's very insightful. I see parallels with some of the storytelling that we'd see in like understanding comics. That's where these come from, basically. Like I, the idea of like workable prototypes and stuff. Like like I got that from the Jesse Shell yeah. book, and that's what these scripts are. Yeah. So that's a book that I think is really interesting and can bring some ideas into comics, into script writing, into any any kind of storytelling. Out on a Wire is Jessica Abel's collection of. Mostly interviews with podcasters and sort of how they make and edit their podcast. It started with uh, Radio and Illustrated Guide, the This American Life book. That's a really good one. Um, Robert McKee's story is a popular one that like Brian Michael Bendis talks about and was featured in the adaptation movie uh, starring Nicolas Cage. I would recommend going to the adaptation movie maybe first and see if it speaks to you. Uh, I think that's a real fun depiction of the character. And one last one is Hitchcock Truffaut. Mm. These are two filmmakers talking about the ideas behind the decisions they make in their filmmaking. Very practical and very applicable to visual storytelling. Let me ask you this about Hitchcock Truffaut. Are there a lot of visual examples? Because if you go to archive.org, the entire like 12 hour conversation between Hitchcock and Truffaut that is transcribed into the book is available to listen to in like an MP3 format or just like on your you know iPod or whatever when you're running or working in your sketchbook or whatever. And I highly recommend uh, just listening to that if you if you want to if you want to work and absorb the the intel at the same time. My favorite way of absorbing Hitchcock Truffaut. It's a very long process, but if you're not familiar, Truffaut, French director, who is like uh, uh, Kohai. And, and Hitchcock is senpai, and so, so Truffaut is asking these questions, and they go through the entire body of Alfred Hitchcock's work from the very beginning to the end, uh, or at least up to that point that they are in, in, the, in their careers. So my recommendation is you listen to one, go watch the movie, listen to another, because they are broken up in like half hour bits if you find a good section half hour bits, watch the movie, and boy, I tell you, from the very beginning, when it comes to visual storytelling and being interesting, Hitchcock had it from day one, man, The Lodger. There's a scene in The Lodger where guy's walking up to uh, his, his bedroom, and the shot is like from, it's one of those staircases that you could look at the bottom yes. floor, and you just watch this hand yeah. going up the staircase and getting bigger and bigger. That's amazing, man. Yeah. I got I chills thinking about it. The, the MP3 version sounds like the way to go. There, there are some visual examples in the book, the copy I have, but definitely uh, listening to, to the, those guys talk, I think, would be beneficial. And then comparing it, watching those movies, interspersing the movies with what they're covering, fantastic. That's a good 101, man. But listen, we might have these projects finished, man, but there are many other deadlines that we have to contend with, man. So we have to get back to that stuff, man. I want you guys to like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Once you hit subscribe, hit that bell icon. It'll let you know whenever we have new videos posted online. You can support us by picking up merch, t-shirts, mugs, hats, bags on Spreadshop. Uh, link below the video. These are some examples of some of the t-shirt designs that, that we have up right now. The snail mail PO box is in the link below, is in the description below as well. So we're gonna get back to, to doing our thing, man. But you guys know what your marching orders are. Read more comics. And draw one panel a day. <laughs>